You're listening to P-R-O-X. So then speaking of the challenges between searching and missing, like just going back to searching days, that mm-hmm. was a low budget movie. It was very, very low. And I think one thing I always think about is it means usually you have less people who all have to do more jobs oh, yeah. to get the movie made. Well, I mean, I was talking to Kong Yu our co-producer on searching and on missing the other day, and we were cracking up about this because we were doing something in post and we were reflecting on how on searching the team of people that usually does the following jobs, right? Like location managing, production coordinating, production managing, line producing, creative producing, all the producing, like those eight, nine people, (laughs) it was me, you, and Kong Yu on searching. Like we were doing everything and it was bananas and cut to missing. And like we had a bit more of a proper budget on this one. Yes, I'm missing. There was about 20 people who had all those jobs. There was 20 people that had those jobs. You're listening to In Proximity. Natalie Kasabian is an award-winning film producer who has worked on both independent and studio films. She produced three movies with the Duplass brothers, including Duck Butter, directed by Miguel Arteta. And she produced All About Nina, starring Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Common. As the producer of the thrillers Searching, Run, and most recently, Missing, She's a frequent collaborator of writer-director-producer Anish Chaganti and writer-producer-proximity founder Sev Ohanian. Anish and Sev were on a previous episode of this podcast, breaking down their writing partnership and process. So if you haven't listened to that yet, please do yourself a favor and check it out. Now, Sev and Natalie are partners in work and life. Yes, they're married, and we somehow convinced them to sit down together for this podcast. They share how they met, how they started working together, their tactics for producing both independent and studio films, and the secret to working successfully with your life partner. Hi, I'm Natalie Kasabian, and I'm a producer. Hey, I'm Sav Ohanian. I'm a producer, sometimes screenwriter, and founder at Proximity Media. And I'm here in proximity with Natalie uh, at our Proximity Media offices. And actually, I don't know if there's anyone in the world that I am in closer proximity to than you, because we are producing partners. We made most notably searching and missing, but also we happen to be married. That is correct. A lot of overlapping proximity. Exactly. I think we should probably start with when did we first become in proximity to one another? Let's do it. Okay, so that was 2014. Yep. We were both students at USC's film school. I was a recent graduate. I was a student. You you had just graduated. And we met uh, where a lot of people meet, which was at a networking event on campus for the Armenian Students Association because they're both Armenian American. Very exclusive club. (laughs) It was, a, it was a networking event where it was a mix of current students and like recent grads. And it was people from all different, you know, different careers and fields. And I remember walking around and realizing, oh, you're the only other film person here, the only mm-hmm. other Armenian in film. So at some point we naturally connected. Exactly. And I remember you were, I think when you first saw me, you were just immediately smitten. <laughs> no. Right? <laughs> that's, that's how I remember it. No. <laughs> opposite but no you were it's funny because you were like such a ball of energy and you had i think you'd just written a script with a niche yes. and i'm writing with a niche to tag into your writing partner and our directing partner you were like so excited to pitch it well of course i mean it was we wrote a great script and i was you know i was probably trying to impress you i'm not gonna lie and now that i know you i realize you were in your phase of like practicing the pitch yes exactly. so you saw me as like a target to practice Ex- exactly <laughs> And I remember I I was pitching you. I was like, hey, like, let me tell you this story I've been writing. And I got into it. I, w- I really gave you the full-blown pitch. And something happened during the middle of this pitch that had never, and I don't think has ever happened even since, which is that you interrupted me. I did. And it was, it was a, quite rude. Yes, I agree. It wasn't rude. It was, a, it was a great pitch. But no, it was crazy because I kind of predicted the end of your story, the end of your pitch. And I remember you were like, speechless for a second and you were like that's exactly it i think i even asked you i'm like do you know a niche like how you did do, ask how do you me know that. this like and i did not know a niche and yeah it was kind of awesome because our first meeting ever was like realizing that we spoke the same story language right yeah, away. yeah it's crazy i remember um 
momentarily feeling slighted <laughs> by you. <laughs> And then, and then also realizing, wait, this is actually really cool. And like you said, we're on the same page creatively and story wise. And that genuinely, that I guess that was a meet cute, and that led to us being friends and keeping in touch. And then eventually starting to date. A few months later, I remember I was at the time. This is like after I had been a producer on Fruitvale Station, which had such a great run, and I was very much in my phase of making indie films. That any opportunity that I would get to produce a good movie, I would take it. And I I think at the time you were working in production. I was for, working in production for documentary yeah. films, yep. right? Like you were like helping Correct. office paying and whatever yep. coordinating that needed, coordinating all that stuff. And I I had a movie that I was going to go produce in Savannah, Georgia, and I remember even like I say you know saying goodbye to you like hey I'll see you in a few weeks, me months, whatever I'm about to go yeah. make this movie, and. I even thought for a moment about even asking you to come produce with me, but I don't think you were into that. I think you did ask me. So I'd switched over. I was I was actually an assistant to producer at the time. Right. But if you remember, I was miserable because mm -hmm. I was a horrible assistant. <laughs> sure. And I, I was pretty sure I was going to get fired. So I was thinking about leaving. You would ask me to come work on it with you. Yeah. Because you needed more like production support. Sure. But I remember being like, I don't know if I want to work together, mix that, you know. Sure. Like it's one thing to have a relationship and one thing to be, you know, yeah. professional partners, but not necessarily have both. And I, you know, you you were making your way and I think I wanted to make my own and, and meet, meet my own people, but cut to. Well, what happened was I was in Savannah, Georgia, and we were, it was a tiny movie. I'm talking like under a half a million dollars yeah. in budget, like very small. And it was in some ways a movie that I had a little bit inherited from another producer. and. I think it was day one of filming and I immediately realized like, oh, this is going to be a sinking ship. Like I did not have the right support and it wasn't properly set up, obviously partially my fault, but really I just needed some help. And I remember calling you and I was like, hey, babe, like, what are you up to? And I think it was your literally your last day on the job. Yeah, right? it was crazy because I'd put in like my two weeks. It was my last day on the job. And I, I was looking forward to some time, <laughs> some time off. And then you were just like, I could hear it in your voice. You, you, you needed someone. I remember you were like, okay, well, when do you need me to fly out? And I was like, now. Yeah. Like, what is the next flight you can get on? I think I booked a ticket for the next morning. And I remember like I was sending you the script. I was even the entire flight. You were like you had nonstop me the on the flight. Wi-Fi. Exactly. Yeah. You got into town and, you know, you immediately joined this like this crazy production that was already in progress. And I will say, like, legit, you straight up helped save that film. You certainly saved me because because your involvement just immediately made everything chiller. Everything got streamlined. Everything was taken care of. And I could focus on the creative and work with the director. And it was it was actually like a really good, good experience, I think, working together. Definitely. I think it was crazy because I was so nervous about the idea of us working together. And it felt so effortless once I got there. What were you nervous about? I think the obvious, like, how do we keep balance? How do we not just talk about work all day long? And even though we, it, it's our passion and it's so much fun, but we already, all we do is talk about film that I was like, <laughs> if we work together too, like then we're going to have the same war stories. And, and I think it was always fun, like hearing about your experience and me coming to the table with other experiences. So I, I was afraid of like, what happens if everything's enmeshed, but it just ended up being so effortless working together and honestly, so much fun. After that experience, did we want to keep working together? Not really, because I, so if you remember after that movie, Mel Eslin yes. was a producer, a badass producer mm -hmm. on that film. Her and I really clicked. And when I, we came back to LA, she had set up like a five picture deal with, she was running Duplass Brothers Productions at mm -hmm. the time um, and still is. And she was like, hey, are you down to come and like be my co-pee? And I have all these films and you want to come like work with me? And I was like, hell yeah, it's a dream come true. Like, this is what I want to do. I want to produce. I want to creative produce. And so I started working with Mel. And then something happened, if you remember, where I was going to do a movie called Duck Butter. Yes. And we were like prepping that. But something happened with cast. And I think we pushed like maybe even by a year. Mm -hmm. And you were prepping a different film also with Mel mm -hmm. that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> exactly. And because that one pushed, and I think you may have lost someone on your, I can't remember the details, yeah, but yeah. you called me and were like, hey, round two? Exactly. I was like, I, I don't know why I'm fighting it at this point. Like, it was so effortless last time. And That's right. And that was the first time that you were actually like a producer. Because yeah. I think on, on Intervention, on I the was, first movie, you were more production. Yeah. And um, and yeah, I think on, on the second film, which is a movie called Take Me, directed by Pat Healy, written by Mac Mikowski, 
it was a great experience. It was very smooth and and we spoke the same language and we were able to problem solve and and really kind of I think be additive as a team on that film. Yeah. But even at this point, it still wasn't quite gonna be like an ongoing thing. We were always kind of taking it one step at a time. But while this was happening, I was writing and developing searching. I think at the time we called it search, and this is with obviously my partner Anish Chaganti, who I write with. And I was getting to the point in the script that I was feeling really confident. I was like, I think we have a really strong piece of material. I had a lot of faith in Anish as a filmmaker. He would be his first time directing, but I knew he can pull it off. It was going to be my first chance being a quote unquote lead creative producer. And knowing that we were very close to getting a green light to actually start prepping and shooting this movie, it was top of my mind to bring you on as a producer. And it wasn't just because, oh, like this is going to be a great film. I should have Nat as my girlfriend at the time be part of it. But rather, I think we're going to need all the help we can get to really pull this thing off. And I remember when I asked you, I think Anish and I asked you, because you, at this point you got to know Anish, you actually turned us down. That's a slight mischaracterization. <laughs> I was unavailable. So, so yes. that the movie that had pushed was finally going. And it was with an awesome director, Miguel Arteta. And right. it was kind of going to be like the most challenging thing I'd done so far. And I think that might have been my first capital P. I'm, right, I'm right. a producer. I'm going to be kind of on the ground um, on that one. So I was unavailable. But then I remember you guys sent me, it wasn't even a script yet. There was an outline. Mm -hmm. It was just like all the beats, but, you know, not not fully fleshed out yet. And actually, I think, I don't know if you remember this, but I was, I think I was on the way from like a location scout or something, driving across town. You called me and you were like, check your email. It's in your inbox. Mm -hmm. And you guys were like so giddy, you and Anish. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I got to pull over. Like, I, I, I'm i just going to read this thing. So I pulled over. I was in Toluca. Like, the first thing I saw was like a pub. <laughs> it was like five o'clock in the afternoon. Walked into the pub, got some lunch. And I sat down to read it. And I remember like instantly feeling really, really jealous. Not of you and Anish, but of like the person that was going to be like, you know, your right hand on this one. Because I was like, man, I can't do it. I have this movie. I'm already committed. I'm already in it. And then I called you guys. I walked outside. I was pacing in Toluca Lake. <laughs> and I remember just telling you guys how much I loved it. And this works. And like all the emotional elements were in there. All the story beats, like the structure of like, this is the order of the events. It was all just there, just in the outline. And like, as I was talking, I was like, yeah, I'm doing this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how I'm not going to do this movie. I was, I was too excited. You know, this thing wasn't even fleshed mm -hmm. out yet. You know what's funny? Anish and I thought we did not need a script for searching. Do you remember this? I do. <laughs> it was really naive. We were like, well, it's a computer movie. Like, it's not Well, in your guys' defense, you were like, it's a, yeah, it takes place on computers. I think Anish was convinced the script would be 300 pages long. And I could see why, because it would be like interior, Google Chrome, yeah. Facebook. Like, it's, it's not what you typically expect. And we were committed to not writing a full screenplay because we thought our outline scriptment had it all. And you were the one that were like, nope. <laughs> and you guys hated me, but I was like, there's no Nat's way. making us write a final draft. You have to write in final draft because how are we going to make this movie? Yeah. And then once we had it done, we were like, oh, yeah, this is this made perfect sense. Thanks, yeah. Nat. <laughs> Dude, I have to be honest with you. I think I was telling Anish, like, if you say no, I don't know how we make this movie. Because it was generally at that point where, like, I knew I needed all the help we can get. And I trusted you. I think that's such an important quality in, in producing together is being yeah. able to really have that implicit um, trust. And what's crazy is like you were you were now in your phase as a producer where you were producing a ton of indies and I think you were getting your MBA at the time also. Yep. So the fact that you committed to, to helping the producer searching without even quite knowing how you're going to do it, it spoke volumes. Searching was an independent film, financed entirely privately, yep. no guarantee of distribution, and uh, no guarantee of anything. No guarantees, period. And it yeah. was especially an experimental movie that takes place on computers, and who knew? And then we had Missing, which was the follow up standalone sequel that Sony asked us to make, that is a studio movie. So, therefore, it's not, you know, I'll be honest, Searching's budget was $880,000 yeah. all in, shot in 13 days. 13 days, non-union. Exactly. Missing's budget is 
way more than that, but it's still a fraction of what most movies cost. It's yeah. still extremely a, considered a low budget, small budget, and you know, type of movie. But it's a studio movie. There is a guarantee of a lot of stuff, and there was the pressure of a release date always. And on top of that, there was also this expectation that Searching was considered, you know, a hit movie with how much it made and, and the reviews and stuff. Would Missing, you know, stand up to that? That was always a big part of it. That was a big part. And also not just the pressure of release date, but pressure of, I think there was this magic on Searching where we did have financiers and we had people that financially we were responsible to. But in a lot of ways, we had a crazy amount of creative freedom. Yeah. And it felt like that movie was made in the edit with the five of us, mm -hmm. you know, and barely any notes and, and anyone to, to answer to. Yeah. We had, we had honestly creative control of researching, we had, which we'll never have again. In yeah. And it, it was, it was amazing. It was like light lightning in a bottle. So then to go from that to missing where from the very first pitch, the studio was involved. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big change, a big shift for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think our process changed a little bit. When I take a step back and look at the film missing, I, I am proud that I feel like we we captured what we set out to do. Mm -hmm. We made the film we wanted to make and we did protect the creative. Exactly. So then speaking of the challenges between Searching and Missing, like just going back to Searching Days, mm -hmm. that was a low budget movie. It was very, very low. And I think one thing I always think about is it means usually you have less people who all have to do more jobs oh, yeah. to get the movie made. Well, I mean, I was talking to Kong Yu our co-producer on Searching and on Missing, the other day and we were cracking up about this because we were doing something in post and we were reflecting on how on searching the team of people that usually does the following jobs right like location managing production coordinating production managing line producing creative producing all the producing like those eight nine people <laughs> it was me you and Kong you yes. on searching like we were doing everything and it was bananas and cut to missing, and like we had a bit more of a proper budget on this one. Yes, I'm missing. There was about 20 people who had all those There's jobs. There's 20 exactly. people that had those jobs. I'm curious, like, how would you break down the process that we have as producers, especially when we work together? One thing that we've carried on each project, I would say a big pillar is communication. And then, of course, Google Docs. <laughs> like Google Docs. Like, man, we could write a novel on how Google Docs have sa saved our movies. Literally. There's been a couple times in our, you know, journey together as producers where like a Google Doc email where it's like me, you, and Anish mm -hmm. all chiming in has like quite literally saved our asses on, on a movie. Right, because there, you know, we'll have a situation where there's some kind of point of conflict or if a financier or a studio partner really wants to do X thing, but we know that Y thing is what the movie needs and we've tried to have discussions and it's like when all else fails, bust out an email. It's like, let's go. It's time and, to go. And we put together this extremely comprehensive email that like cites our our reasoning, our deductions, our logic, and and really tries to be a perfect on the record way of like making our, you know, our our ideas heard. And you're right, like one of us will draft an email, then Anish will get in and do his pass. So I'll do my pass and so forth. And it, it's, you know, this is also almost like boring, but it really is like ultimately what helps us make these movies the way we can. But what else? I think I think as far as like our producing skills, I think about like the way we've incorporated feedback into the process because I do one. think ultimately we want to make films for audiences. And yeah. one way to really ensure that we're doing that the right way is to bring them into the process and, and navigate that. Can you, can you speak about how we do that? Yeah. And I think we learned how to do this better, I think, from our indie films. So on the indie films, like one of our grievances was always like, there's never enough time, right? Like mm -hmm. never enough time to do enough feedback and really like mine an audience. And so one thing we said we were going to do on movies where we were in charge is like really take time and put the movie in front of an audience. And like what a, it's such a gift, obviously, when people haven't seen the thing that you've been watching 18,000 times and mm -hmm. you've, you've read it, you've watched it, you're there every day. So I, I, I love that we both have this like same philosophy on like, let's get people in there. Let's ask 200 questions, you mm -hmm. know, let's go really in depth. So like a typical feedback screening that people are probably used to is you come, you watch a movie, and then usually there's it's like, what do you light think? questions light, about yeah, what do you think, and people have an opportunity to like weigh in. And I think we go a little bit deeper than that. And there's the usual questions usually of like pace and tone, and we go super deep. And again, like you said, it's because our movies are very, it's with the audience in mind. And I think especially with the thrillers we've made, mm -hmm. it's like, it, did, did you catch this clue? Did this beat land for you? Going really granular. Yeah, so we actually have like the editors have the movie up 
and scrolling through it as yep. we ask the questions. Yep. Like literally people, people, hey, you guys remember this one beat right here? Like who laughed at that or who thought it was lame or and so forth. And what's been great is seeing, because you, you've you been doing it on Missing, you know, like yeah. it's, you're literally quite. But I've been stealing all your tricks. I'm <laughs> sure, <searching>. sure. Like <laughs> you know, we'll have an audience that's somewhere between 10 to 30, 40 people. And it's being able to like kind of work the crowd. Like I've, I've see you how like if someone has been really shy not speaking up, you tend to call on them and encourage them to speak up more. Or if someone's been maybe uh, dominating the room too much, you find very subtle ways to get that person to give more space to others. And it's really interesting because while you're up there managing the crowd, the rest of us are in the back row furiously like whispering to each other and like taking like takeaways and oh my god and we're and we have that group text that yep. we're literally texting you ask this don't ask that and you look at and your and i'm phone. like dude keep the channels clear yeah like, because important things someone only. is inevitably sending a bunch of memes um yeah. but that has been a really good process because i think what happens after those feedback screenings is the you know the five of us you know when i say five i mean you me and each other partner and and for the case of missing it's will merrick and nick johnson the two directors we really get together and we we analyze like okay what do we what do we what have we learned you know like what's we the takeaway we spend days honestly mm -hmm. we spend days on 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 the marker board just like putting everything up what worked what didn't work exactly and i know obviously a lot of like all films probably do this to an extent but with us it's really trying to create a system that has invited the audience feedback but in a way that doesn't allow that feedback to also take over either naturally what happens especially you know talking about feedback screenings is morale. I think that's a big part of what I think you and I really strive to do when we when we produce these projects is how do we keep the morale up? Because that, that's a that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I feel like and I, I think we agree on this. Like a big part of our job as producers is just keeping keeping the energy up but also the the positivity because mm -hmm. it can be hard especially after sometimes the screenings don't go mm -hmm. you know as as great as you hoped. And also you're under like a mountain of, of notes and it, sometimes you feel like you can't get out from under it. So I feel like you and I always come in and and bring that bring that energy and kind of like try to reinvigorate everyone and keep try to get us back to the place where we're being creative and, and solution driven. You know what I mean? And not not lingering on on the negative too much. Exactly. I mean, I think, look. We, I think as producers, I do, I do know we feel just as much investment and ownership as any of the directors we work with, but I think because we're producers, you and I know that the only way to move forward and to beat whatever obstacle we're facing is positivity and yeah. is a desire to fix and continue to iterate and continue to try and make something work that we don't allow ourselves to ever show that negativity, at least amongst the group. What's nice about you and me being husband and wife now, with you know, previously just relationships is when we get home at the end yeah, of the day, we get to vent. the truth can really come out between us. We get to be negative to each other. Exactly. <laughs> Another thing with searching is like, we didn't have the studio on, on, the, on the process of making searching, but there were conflict. I mean, there was... With the financier, we had a lot of differences with business decisions. Yeah. And I think a, a, a big one was definitely after after the movie was done, we were finally done. That challenge was over with. Mm -hmm. And it was like, all right, what are we going to do with the film? And we'd submit it to festivals. And we were into Sundance at this point. We got into Sundance. We got into yep. Sundance, which is, you know, ho holy grail, especially for an, an indie film. And there was this question that they put on the table of, well, why don't we, there was a studio that was interested in yeah. seeing the film. And I remember you and I were like, we cannot do this. Well, the financier was saying like, hey, there's a studio that we have a relationship with. We're going to just show them the movie and they'll buy the movie and they'll distribute the movie. Yeah. Which is like amazing because we made the movie with no promises. But having now gotten into Sundance and had you and I having had and multiple the, movies in Sundance yeah. in which we've had movies sell there, we got very alarmed because we were thinking, well, why would we screen the movie for a studio before the festival? Why even engage about having them buy the movie? And their response was, well, it's a big studio. It'll be a big deal. And we were just like, man, like. And they went wrong. It would have been a sure thing. But I think we all knew that there was a chance for something 
even bigger than that. Exactly. We Our whole argument was if we go to the festival and we know we have a good movie, we can have a bidding war where multiple studios can bid. And that way, the deal is better, not even just financially, but rather more guarantees that the movie will have a bigger release and more audiences can see it and, and so forth. The issue was we were just producers on indie film. We had literally no legal power here. We had no power It was all. They yeah. paid for the movie, so therefore, as always, they control the movie. So we were in a really tough situation here. So of course it called for Q Q email Google Doc. Exactly. Amazing. And we put, email. I think it was one of the I mean actually I literally I can pull up the email right now. It was one of the more epic emails we've ever sent. Uh here I'm gonna I'm gonna you mind if I just read it? Go, Hold please, on. I'd I love find to. it. So this was sent uh August 2, 2017 from from us to After hours of, of editing. After many hours <laughs> of Google editing, it was hi there. Our team discussed the topic again, and here are our thoughts. Everyone involved in this film worked their butts off so we can sell the film for a lot of money and have the best distribution deal possible. Here's what we mean specifically. One, we want to sell the movie for enough money to cover the cost of making the movie and to also make a great deal of profit for the investors and for everyone who worked on it. Two, we want to make sure the movie can be seen by as many people as possible in theaters and outside of them. This next part is underlined. We are confident that pre-screening search to any distributor or studio president before a festival premiere will hurt us from achieving the highest marketplace value. And here's why. Number one, if your studio watches the film and either doesn't like it or does not want to make an offer to buy it, there's a high chance people in town will hear about that decision and they will think that the studio did not think search was good enough for them. Therefore, others either offer us low amounts of money or they will not offer us anything at all. Two, if your studio watches Search, likes it, and does want to make an offer to buy the movie, there's no reason for that offer to be a high offer. Yep. Without other competing bids from other distributors, they have no motivation to offer a lot of money because there will be no marketplace pressure for them to give us a good deal before someone else buys the film. What we do know is that the movie is great. If Search plays in any competitive setting, we know that the film will be already positioned for a bidding war, and here's why. One, it's a thrilling, suspenseful story with a lot of emotional heart. Two, it's starring in a, a diverse family, and who doesn't want that? Three, it's a computer movie in the vein of the successful Unfriended, but it's also evolved into something more cinematic and emotional. Four, the director comes from Google commercials and is a new talent in Hollywood. Five, the cast is the most famous cast ever seen in this kind of movie to date. Any distributor will want to make offers, so we should not do anything to jeopardize that. Anyways, it goes on and on and on, but it's, it's it was like, long, wasn't it? Like two or three pages. Oh yeah, and it was like a epic, like trying to like in our it's minds, like an evidence based argument. And it's always the same thing. Like here's what we think, and here are the reasons why yeah. we think that, and so forth. And it worked. Yeah. And you know, we ended the email with basically like, "Thanks for hearing our thoughts on this matter. Please let us know what you think. We are extremely confident in the logic behind this argument." Do you and then do you remember their response? Or do you oh, have yeah. it? I have it right here. It was literally, I agree with your plan. <laughs> we got the financiers to chill. We took the movie to Sundance. We had the bidding war, and we had an incredible distribution deal that honestly would have probably eclipsed anything that we would have had 100%. in that previous thing. And this is after weeks of of them saying no and no and no in person and phone yeah, calls. This, this spurred a lot of in-person debates too, I think. I think the power of a really well-crafted email is obviously it's in writing. It's in the record now. You know, you can't deny something that's been put to the word. And again, our process of having everyone on our team weigh in and we like will debate about commas it's like we want to make sure that we're a speaking for everyone collectively but be like putting our best foot forward you know like and really just you know communicating is 90 percent of producing like communicating as best as possible like the real intent behind the team back here and i, I think this was the email i think that taught us the power of these emails yeah i mean i, we I brought it we brought it with us after i mean on missing like you know there's been endless emails about like you know debates with the studio about how the movie should end and, or and even even just down to one i remember there was one note we were all kind of not on the same page on and we went back and forth and i think one of our emails was had so many arguments for why we were right <laughs> yeah about this one story point that i bet you like by the time they got halfway through the email they probably just gave up yeah i mean because they're like you guys are right go for it yeah but i, I think it's funny I think our Sony, our, our our execs at Sony have characterized you and me in particular as like good producers and that we care. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I can't speak for other producers, but you and I clearly really, really, really put a lot of our energy into these things. And we don't want to give up on behalf of our filmmakers or directors who also care, but they're sometimes burdened with other things. So we take it upon ourselves to really be 
this interference there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things, just going back to communication, like we've never, I think we both don't subscribe to this idea of like, you have to always protect your director or keep them away, shelter them from things. Mm -hmm. And like, while you are there to, you want to protect their time, right? So that they can do the job they have to do. I think you and I are very transparent with our directors. Yes. And we never want to burden them with what's going on behind the scenes, but it doesn't help anyone for them to be in the dark, to be in the dark. Yeah, about we, we want to always make sure that they're, they have an awareness of all things. And yeah. usually we are updating them about problems while we're also telling them our solution. Our solution yeah. Um, but I agree with you. Like part of communication is that transparency and just candor. And that's how we work as producing partners too. I remember, you know, calling you a couple of times on missing when maybe you weren't at the office or whatever and being like, so this happened. But like, here's my three things. What do you what do you think? Exactly. That's always been our. Because I think, you know, with, with Missing, you became the lead producer and I went off to help, you know, start this company proximity with Brian yeah. Zinzi. And honestly, even speaking of us working as partners and as, as a relationship, like you were the one who encouraged me to really start proximity with these guys. Yeah. I mean, it was a big turning point realizing that, you know, my favorite thing I always say, like every time we do, we do a lot of projects separately. Obviously, you have stuff with proximity and I keep a slate that I produce on my own, which has been really nice, I think, for for balance. But proximity was a huge turning point because it was like, man, my favorite producing partner is you. My favorite team to work with is the searching team with Anish and Will and Nick. And when proximity came about, it was like, well, th this is amazing. You got to go do this and this is going to be good for us on so many levels. But it was like, all right, I got I to go, you know, I got to go take the lead now mm -hmm. and not not have you there necessarily physically there every step of the way. But I feel like it did a good thing for our relationship. I agree Would too. You agree? I 100% I agree. I think, I mean, we, you know, when we're home, it's so nice. I mean, to me, like to be in a relationship with who, with someone who is my producing partner, it's amazing because I can be eating my breakfast cereal and realize I just thought of a solution to a problem we've been having in the edit. And I, all I have to do is literally lean over the breakfast table and pitch it to you. Yeah. And right there, you can give me immediate feedback. Or you and I might come home after a really long, stressful day, and we can suddenly be workshopping together, literally as we get ready for bed, because we just have that luxury and that trust. But I think to your point, what has probably kept it healthy is that we also work on things not together. Yeah, absolutely. Because if it was maybe all we did together, who knows if that would might be, you know, maybe that wouldn't be good for a relationship. Well, I don't know if it wouldn't be good. Like, I think it'd be fine because we're so... This is our passion at the end of the day. The cool thing about having separate projects is the perspective that we can each right. bring, right? Like you you, you went off and you, you guys did Space Jam too, mm -hmm. which was huge, you know, mm -hmm. and like the stuff that you learned on that, the experiences you had, like you made me a better producer by just sharing that stuff with me mm -hmm. while I was working on Missing. You know what I mean? I think that's been really cool having that, the different perspectives that we can each bring. 100%. Time for our Prox Rex. Yes. What is one book, movie, documentary, article, YouTube series, anything that you would recommend somebody checks out to help them maybe potentially when it comes to producing? Mine's an oldie, but a goodie, a classic. It's Christine Vachon's Shooting to Kill. Mm -hmm. And it's specifically about indie producing, but I think it applies to all producing. But my favorite thing about that book is like it has my favorite quote about indie filmmaking ever which is, I'm going to butcher it, but something about how making any movie is like having a baby. It's really, really painful while you're like pushing it out. But once it's over and you look at the thing, you can't wait to do it again. And it's so true. That's true of all filmmaking, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a great quote. My recommendation would be a book called The Big Picture. It came out a few years ago and it was actually inspired by the Sony leak, if you remember from a couple of years ago. This author pour through all of the leaked emails and crafted an entire book that really tries to talk about the quote unquote big picture about the direction that the Hollywood studios and the industry at large is going in. He didn't incorporate any of like the really personal stuff that came out of the leaks, but rather 
analyzing the way some of the studio heads were responding to pitches or the direction that they wanted to take uh, franchises. And really, it was so insightful because it was no BS. It was literally inspired by real interdepartmental emails between actual studio executives. And the takeaway that you get from it is not at all juicy and scandalous, but rather very pedantic. It's very academic in how you can really get a sense of where the studio is today. I couldn't recommend it enough. That's The Big Picture by author Ben Fritz. Well, Natalie Kasabian, thank you so much for being in proximity with me today. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Thanks for being my producing partner. Thank you for being my life partner. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> In Proximity is a production of Proximity Media. If you like the show, be sure to follow, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends and loved ones to do the same. Seriously, you can do that right now. Send a link to someone who you think might really like this conversation. Learn more and read transcripts of this episode and others on proximitymedia.com. Don't forget to follow at Proximity Media on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. The show is produced by me, Paula Mardo. Executive producers are Ryan Kugler, Zinzi Kugler, Sev Ohanian, and me. Our theme song and additional music is composed by Ludwig Gorenson. Ken Nana is our sound designer and mix engineer. Paulina Cherizova is our production assistant. Audio editing for this episode is by Cedric Wilson. Special thanks to the whole Proximity Media team and to you for listening to In Proximity. Meet you back here next week. near the end of the shoot because it was it was chaotic yes. obviously a 13 day shoot the someone on the camera team I remember was like giggling and I think maybe me and Anish were I don't know if you were there but we were like what are you guys laughing about and they're like you guys never seen this house before I was like no it was our first time shooting here isn't it great like just <laughs> so giddy and we realized that what they shoot at this house was it was a porn, porn house, house. It was a porn house in the valley. All the clues were in front of us the whole we were, time. We were so We naive. shot these beautiful scenes of a family coming together and loving each other in, in a porn house. Yeah. But you know what? It got the job done.